Hello and welcome. This is the Studio Stack Podcast. Each week we go behind the scenes and talk to industry leaders about what it takes to build, join, and invest in startup studios. I am your host, Deanna Lissage, and this podcast is your Startup Studio Masterclass. On today's show, we have Andrew Amen, CEO of 923 Digital Ventures. Andrew is an incredible entrepreneur with an extensive profile. Um, as an engineer, he followed the entrepreneurship path and he holds patents for nuclear submarine components and pioneered three supply chain innovations. Um, in 2012, he launched 923 Ventures as a digital product agency, which has to date launched 14 internal startups, including one of his own, which had an exit in 2017, and they've launched over 50 new ventures for clients. Now, during the pandemic, Andrew and his team began transitioning the agency to a studio model, and they were recently featured in the top 500 fastest growing companies on the Inc. 5000 list. On today's episode, we get into a lot. Uh, we talk about what it takes to transition from a tech agency to a builder studio, entrepreneurship as a path for first-time founders, how to develop a flywheel for new venture creation, um, the unique cash and equity model that 923 uses to co-build ventures with entrepreneurs, and much, much more. Andrew's brain works at warp speed, and he's such a refreshing innovator and just such a genuine human being. Um, I can't wait to dive into this chat. So with that, I'll, I'll get out of the way. Enjoy the episode. Well, hi, Andrew. Welcome to the Studio Sack Podcast. Thank you for joining. Thanks for having me, Diana. I've, I've been looking forward to this episode for so long. Um, I'm so excited for today because um, your background is so versatile. You know, you've been an entrepreneur, solopreneur, engineer, CEO, you've led big teams and done small projects and, you know, kind of learned a lot. And I think our listeners are really going to learn a lot from your experience. So um, super excited uh, and, and grateful that you jumped on. Um, yeah, excited to be here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the first question that I kind of always start out with is what is your definition of a startup studio? Yeah. So, you know, we run kind of a unique startup studio. We didn't actually know we were a studio for a while until the last year when we started doing research. But I think what we define a startup studio as is we're a group of entrepreneurs, designers and engineers and that build startups repeatedly at the early stage. Whether a client comes to us or we're creating our own or an entrepreneur comes to us, we're that sliver of building a product uh, when somebody knows that something's good and they want to make it great. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great definition. I think it, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot in there. And I, a lot of that comes from kind of your background and you've, you've been an innovator your whole life. Um, and as a solo entrepreneur, you've kind of worked on many ideas and sometimes at the same time, you know, you feel like running the agency and a couple startups and all of this. And so I'm curious, um, do you think that the studio model can be applied by solo entrepreneurs who's just, you know, it's just them, they have a ton of ideas. They're trying to work through them. They don't have a team yet. Can they apply the startup studio principles and maybe you know try to innovate faster or more successfully? Yes, I think they can. And you know, when I'm the history that you mentioned that I'm you know running an agency and startups at the same time, it's not a bad place to start, but it is definitely not sustainable. Um, and so I would say, from a solo entrepreneur standpoint, the best thing you can do is uh, look at the landscape of what you're trying to get into. What industry are you really trying to solve? And can you be a servant to that industry? Uh, can you walk into an office and ask for an employment job where you become a consultant or an employee for a job at a place that is, is producing that idea repetitively? And so an example that I give all the time is, you know, let's say you came up with the greatest dog toy and you think that it's the best toy that, uh, that you know, this dog can use, your dog loves it. Um, you can go and start a startup and that, you know, try to see if you can conquer as many dogs as possible that are going to use this toy, or you can walk into you know one of the bigger dog toy manufacturers and ask for a job. And after a year, try to introduce them to that, that dog toy idea. And if they like it, they're going to test it and they're going to test it against a bunch of dogs, you know, and make sure that it works. And if it works, they're going to like, you know, that you work for them. If it doesn't work, well, at least you still have an employment gig, right? And you're not fired and on the street. Um, but I think that idea of, you know, trying a bunch of ideas, at repetitively and seeing what sticks is more valuable than going after one idea uh, because you have the ability to kind of pivot and navigate while you're learning an industry. So from a solo entrepreneur idea, I think learning an industry is more important than trying to solve a specific problem. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I, I like, you know, 
the idea of entrepreneurship is it goes a little bit against the traditional entrepreneur. I'm going to go off on my own and do it on my own. But I think there's tons of benefits to the model and you learn a lot about what you like to do and what you don't like to do and how to build startups and what the innovation process looks like. And, you know, that, that all takes a lot of time to figure out. And so the best way to do it is to learn kind of on the job. Um, that's something that you did. I think, you know, diving into your background a little bit, you know, what was the process for entrepreneurship like to you? And then how did you emerge from that to basically, you know, launch into 923 uh, Ventures? Yeah, I think not being afraid to produce ideas at a company. So I was a mechanical engineer out of school. Um, I worked on nuclear submarines for the first five years of my life. And then I went to a nuclear submarine facility in Massachusetts. Uh, but during that process, you know, I didn't sit at a desk and just work on a part. I came up with processes and solutions for that company that can solve something that they weren't solving before, right? Like a problem that they had that they needed a more efficient process. And I would just ask if I can do it myself. Um, and so repetitively, I've created systems for, you know, supply chain innovations. Uh, and well, I would just- a couple of patents. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I produced one in uh, 2015. Uh, it's a supply chain. We were the first company to create uh, Bluetooth tracking on manufacturing parts. Uh, and so we got a patent on that process and that idea. Uh, but I'll tell you, you know, as an entrepreneur and looking at, you know, what they call the canvas model of, of being that servant of producing an idea, I had to present 20 times to the same people, the same slides for the return on investment so that it would finally stick because I believed so strongly that it would work. Um, and the return on investment was so soon that it was just silly not to go forward with it. Um, it did involve patents and a new supply chain methodology. Um, and so that was a little bit of a long tail, you know, it takes a little bit longer to go through that process. But I think the concept of continually to present your ideas and continually to go after your boss and, and try to be, you know, a, a, an assistant, a helper, an idea man, so that he looks good. Uh, I think that's what finally propelled me to entrepreneurship, which is like, all right, I've done this so much, you know, for the companies that I've worked for. I might as well continue to do this for myself. And I think that's where the passion of 923 really comes from, is that repetitive ideas of, of producing products. Yeah. And I think the thing that I'll note there is that, you know, from any, anyone listening to this and thinking entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, um, remember that, you know, like from the story, Andrew didn't ask or nobody asked Andrew to do that. Like he right. just kind of entered this, you know, had this innovation spirit. And I think that comes from, you know, a lot of your, I, I've, I've dove into your background a little bit. I know, you know, with an engineer and then turned entrepreneur, you have these like interesting ideas on how things work and you, and you always seek to understand how things work. And I think if you're an entrepreneur, you should be constantly trying to innovate and dive deeper and figure out how things work and how they could work better. But don't wait for someone to ask you to, right. to innovate on a process or to make it something better or different um, because they never will. And so you have to take those opportunities for yourself. Um, and that's kind of what you did with 923, right? Like, so what was the evolution of the venture studio from, you know, the beginning and to where you're kind of transitioning it today? Yeah. And that's a really great transition because what I was doing in manufacturing and, and, as a mechanical engineer was understanding that there was a, uh, like a process, like an efficiency process that I was trying to improve. And I tried a hundred things, right? I remember just sitting at my desk and mathematically trying to figure out how to triangulate where parts could sit in the shop. And it just, it's impossible sometimes. And like, I knew that it wasn't a process that, uh, like it, it was going to be solved. It's just a matter of what iteration was it going to be solved at. And so when you look at like the studio model, when we started 923 digital, we didn't know that we were an agency and a startup builder. We just knew we were really good at building products and we just kept building really good products. You know, and we've done 14 startups at this point on top of the 50 client projects that we've built. And it's just an iterative process of understanding when you start with a login screen and you end with a client solution or a customer solution where they're using your, like a product, that process is very repetitive uh, and we're getting better and better. And it's actually just like any form of technology, it's becoming cheaper, it's becoming faster, and we're getting more efficient at it. Um, just like, you know, your, your MacBook, it's the same process as, as long as we keep it repetitive, and we keep learning and, and iterating on our ideas. I think this startup, startup studio model of creating a product is why clients come to us and say, can you do that for us too? 
Yeah. And I think that's, so when I talk about the benefits of, of venture studios and I talk about economies of scale, that's exactly what I mean. So you use that kind of example of every product has a login screen. That's right. And you build the login screen one time and you use it for everything, you know, it, going forward, you change the design, but that's, and you never have to create, you don't ever have to spend engineer design hours creating a login screen again. And you do that enough times, you have many components that are constantly reusable. And then as well, you know, you've iterated on the process so that you're faster, better, and it becomes cheaper to do it. And so that's what I'm talking about when I say, you know, the economies of scale of venture studios is not only reusing resources, but it's also, you know, using repeatable processes to go faster and do it, you know, at a, at a, at a less expensive um, cost. So I, I think you demonstrated that like absolutely perfectly. And so you started out doing client engagements where you were building what startups or products for other companies? Yeah. So while I was doing the supply chain innovations uh, at, a, at a day job, my co-founder, Pavel, was working at a company called Profitect here in Boston. Um, and they were iterating on, you know, data warehouses for people like that. We know like Walgreens, Home Depot, places like that. And so the two of us met at the Nerd Center in, in Microsoft at, at, um, in Boston, and we wanted to come up with an idea together. And at the time, I thought it was a great idea to transact contact information by shaking hands. Uh, and so we were coming up with these wristbands and trying to figure out how these two people can shake hands. The contact information can go from one phone to the other. That was our original idea. And for five years, we iterated on that until we came up with a solution that got downloaded 400,000 times wow. and that got acquired in 2016, uh, 2017, actually, sorry. That's awesome. and so, what the name of that company? Uh, that was Inigo, I-N-I-G-O. Mm -hmm. The name comes from Inigo Montoya. Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. Uh, so that was like, because everyone wears the name tags, right? So that's where the name came from. Um, but that was our first company and that was our introduction into product building. And we enjoyed that so much. Once that product got acquired, we said, why can't we just keep doing this? And this sounds great. Like we really enjoyed this process. So we built the agency around the idea of product building and people came to us and said, can you build our product? And I think, you know, the engineering process of, of going through that really focuses on the people and the people that have worked at this company, you know, they're just phenomenal human beings. They really understand what it takes to build that product. And because we've done it so many times together, the team has this core, you know, innovation unit that we're all thinking about, that we all really enjoy working together. Um, and it's just a pleasure to go through that process, you know, every single month with a new product and a new customer base. Yeah. And and so you have this really interesting approach to building new ventures. I think every every studio has their own process. Um, some are, are much more docu like kind of well documented than others. And coming from an operations background and being kind of a systems design person, I was just madly in love with the, the process that you outlined um, as far as, you know, you've written about it, you've talked about it, but just this kind of flywheel of, of venture building and how the, each piece feeds off each other. Um, can you go into that a little bit? I just, I love Yeah, that. sure. So we saw the Amazon flywheel and we thought we should create a flywheel of our own. A five minute task should be pretty easy just to draw it out. You know, two years later, <laughs> we're still trying to figure out what the flywheel looks like. <laughs> um, but the, the, what we've stuck with and what we've put in our blogs, and we're still iterating the last step because the startup studio is morphing. Um, but I, I think the idea is, you know, we start with finding an industry and discovering what that industry is. And that's at the top of the flywheel. And I think that's at the top of the flywheel, whether you're an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, you should start with an industry that you're trying to solve a problem for. From that industry, we find clients and people that have problems that need to be solved through digital transformation, right? Like a product that we can build. Once we find those clients, we build that solution for them. And we get profits from that because we're becoming an expert in the industry. We have a person that has a problem that needs to be solved and the solution, the digital solution is creating profits for their customers and us as the builders. We then take those profits and we you know, run that back through that third part of the flywheel, which is the startups. Because we now know the industry, we can build a startup in that industry that solves an additional problem that we noticed while trying to solve the original one. And that process involves finding a CEO or finding an industry expert uh, that can be the CEO of that product idea. Because like we said a little bit ago, when you're running an agency and a startup, it's very hard. So I'd have to start hiring or finding CEOs that can be that product builder for that company. And so they take you know, the, the 
output of the flywheel and they have their own flywheel of creating an a entrepreneurship and an idea and a product and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all of this circles back to the top of the flywheel, which is we're back to the industry part. We're learning that industry through this startup. And that takes years. A lot of entrepreneurs, like a lot of our startups, it takes a year or two to really dive into the industry, be well known, understand who the players are, how, you, how your product is going to solve problems, and just be that listening ear to that industry. And once you're that listening ear to the industry, more clients will come to you to solve problems for that industry. And that's how, what creates the flywheel. I definitely agree with the fact of, you know, kind of taking an entrepreneur with with deep domain expertise and then kind of a filling their gaps and, and building companies that way. Um, yes. I'm curious to see if you can, or to hear a story of a, a startup's journey through your studio. Sure. So um, I'm going to ask because there's two stories. One is how to build a startup with, you know, the studio's idea or how to build a startup with somebody else's idea. Mm-hmm. So I can do both stories or you can pick one. Which I think so. I would say let's, let's go with how to build somebody else's idea because the other question cool. I have for you is how would an entrepreneur, like how do you work with founders? Um, you know, how mm-hmm. would an entrepreneur approach you? What does the yep. equity split look like? Like all that kind sure. of stuff. So I think in, in that story, we'll get the answers to that. Yes, I agree. So when we started, we weren't capable to build with four or five time entrepreneurs right? People that have exited before because we didn't have that track record. Uh, And you need to have a few wins under your belt. So you do need to start building on your own ideas first, show that you can successfully build a studio of repeatable products. And then you'll start seeing, you know, three, four, five time entrepreneurs start coming to you. And when we get introduced to that type of entrepreneur, the idea is basically they know what they want. They know the type of market that they're trying to solve. And uh, we have a specific entrepreneur now, one of the best entrepreneurs I've ever met, uh, gave us a slide deck of his competitors, had 150 competitors in it. And I start looking down the slide deck and it says CEO of DoorDash, CEO of Airbnb, CEO of Grubhub. And I'm like, oh, and then there's a sentence in there, you know, a, a quote. And so I asked him, I was like, you know, did you talk to each of these individuals? He's like, yeah, I talked to everybody on that list. I'm like, oh, you know exactly what you want. You know what needs to be built and you know how this product is going to fit with the competitive landscape that exists. And you get that level of expertise. All our job is, is to build a product that can scale, that is supporting his his industry and that is supporting uh, the customers that eventually are going to come onto this in big numbers. And I think that process involves, you know, finding them first, which is just outreaching and explaining that, we're very good at building products and we would really like, like to build your product. We, we understand you have a great idea. Can we join forces? Mm-hmm. And when you join forces, there's really two avenues. The equity is definitely a conversation. Um, there's pre investment. Usually these entrepreneurs, you know, they know how to raise money. And so they're going to raise money. It's just a matter of time. And do you want to capitalize that on a studio? And I talk to this with all my, my agency friends, if you just do equity, it takes a very long time to see returns mm-hmm. because seven years is a long time to build a free product to wait for that return. You know, one of our agency friends, you know, built a $30 million startup from scratch and is still waiting for the day that he sees $1 out of that. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's frustrating, right? Cause if you continue to do that, yeah, in seven years, you'll have a win. Then the eighth year you'll have your win from your second year. Yep. And it's just hard to think seven years into the future. Mm-hmm. So dividing the cash and the equity, is a very interesting dance that you can do when you meet a a, a successful entrepreneur. And so what we've come up with is that we like to see, we can build the product for free as part of equity, but when that money gets raised, we like to see cash come into our pockets to at least cover the costs. And so we'll do 50% or 25% off the build. And, you know, 25% of that will go towards equity. But as soon as the money gets raised, you know, and we can wait for that raise because hopefully it's within a year we can at least see cash right away. And I think that balance, the entrepreneur is thinking, great, I know I need to raise a million. Now I need to raise a million, 200,000. Mm-hmm. So I can pay for the development once I raise that money. And I know exactly what the development is going to cost. Then I can go on another raise in the future and do the same thing. I know the product team is really good and I know they can build products and I know that's repeatable and I know the cost. So it's almost like hiring a product team into your, your startup that's going to continue to build with you and scale with you as you go through your journey. 
I love that. And I think you just gave, I mean, I'm, I'm sure in, in the audience and listeners, there's light bulbs going off because it does solve a really critical problem. Like you talked about waiting for equity is very hard. It's hard as yeah. an entrepreneur, but it's, a, yeah. it's harder as the agency or the, the yeah. kind of partner or the builder. My question on that is, do you retain equity then? Because obviously there is this bigger payout, like, you know, down the line. Yeah. Um, it depends on the entrepreneur. You know, we had a first time entrepreneur come through this process and we probably wouldn't have wanted to keep equity just because we saw when they went to market, it was a challenge for them to gain that customer base. Mm -hmm. But at least we had the vision at that point where when the person comes to you, everybody's idea is going to have a million downloads on the first week, right? Always. Um, but there's another entrepreneur, the one I'm talking about, you know, in the previous story, who's done this three or four times, you know, he's going to raise money, you know, that customers are going to be there. And you're almost sitting back thinking, I want to put as much equity in this as possible. Like, I, I want to get the exit. Yeah. Um, because this guy is just, he's phenomenal at going through that process. He's done it before. And I think having that ability, like you said, to, to know that you can get the cash if you need it, uh, but also be able to put that back into the equity at the time in which you know the product's going to be successful is more valuable than doing it at the beginning when you have no idea if it's going to work. Right. So, keeping that balance, keeping that understanding, I think it's very important when you go into the market to, to find that entrepreneur. Absolutely. And what would be your advice for first time founders that are interested in working with a studio or, you know, reaching out to a, a studio yours or, you know, a studio like yours, it's kind of a builder studio. Um, what's the, what's the advice for how they get in the door, not having yeah. experience? I always say, I love the Reed Hoffman quote uh, when he talks about his Netflix competitors. And he says, you know, Disney's coming and people asking him like, Disney's going to take over your, your, your market share. You know, Amazon's going to take over your market share. And he sits back and he goes, I'm not worried about my competitors. I'm worried about people sleeping. And it just goes to show that there is a market and there's, you know, advocacy for agencies. And the more that all of us can start preaching that you need to, if you're building a startup, you can go hire a bunch of guys and girls to build your startup for the first time, but you're going to run into mistakes. You're going to loop through problems you don't know how to solve. And it's going to take you three to four times as long as if you would have hired an agency. Why? Because we've done it 50 times. Yeah. We've built 14 startups. We've seen your problem before. And so when you ask us, is this a good idea to put as a customer feature? We're going to give you 25 examples of people that put this feature into their product and never used it. Even though you think it's a great idea, we're going to tell you nobody uses it, right? And that process, it looks expensive up front. You know, an app for us is $150,000 or more. It looks expensive. And you're thinking, why would I pay that when I can pay someone $4,000 a month? At the end of this, it's always going to be a cost, you know, analysis. It, you, you would have saved money if you paid the $150,000 up front because you would have had an app that scales. The other part yeah. that I'll tell first-time entrepreneurs I can't tell you how many people we see hundreds of bids a year, you know, come through our agency of people that want us to build their products. And I see PhoneGap and Xamarin and React Native, like all of those, you know, hybrid solutions that people thought would save them money. After a few years, they're like, I've had enough. I can't update my app anymore. Let's start from scratch and build a native app. So even though you think at the beginning, I'm going to save money and I, I'm just going to get my customers. If you really truly have an idea and you know how to go to market and you know that that solution is going to extract X number of dollars, hiring a startup studio and hiring an agency like us is more valuable in the long run because we're going to build a scalable product. Yeah, I would. I definitely agree with that. I think there's um, the one of the bigger advantages that are often overlooked by founders. Um, studios are good about kind of talking this up a lot and maybe over talking it sometimes, but <laughs> overlooked by founders is the playbooks. Like we know what yeah. works, especially if we're an expert in the industry that you're building. Um, yeah. And you don't, and I promise you don't every, you know, yeah. every entrepreneur thinks this is the feature that needs, and it's the one that always takes the longest cost the most and nobody uses it. So yeah. I totally agree with you. And I think that that's the, it's, it's an incredible value in the venture studio, especially as you do this many, many times and you develop these repeatable processes. It's just like, you know, you, that's what we're here for. Let us be your advisor. I think that that is a really good place to wrap. I think, um, you know, our, the audience, everybody that's interested in kind of getting in touch with you as far as you know, potentially building the, their solution or co-building something, um, where can they kind of go to find you? What, what would be the best way to get in touch? Sure. So uh, we're 923.co and it's spelled out 923.co. I'll put it in um, the show notes. But, all right. Thank you. Yeah. 
the most, you know, the best place to contact me is on Twitter. That's where I'm most active. You know, I met Diana on That's Twitter. What I, met. Um, I was going to say, I met <laughs> you on Twitter. I don't remember. Yeah. I think I messaged you and was like, I love 93. Tell me. <laughs> It's, it's my go-to source for news and, you know, updating, you know, my mind on how people are building products. Um, so Twitter is Andrew Amen, um, A-M-A-N-N. All right, great. Thank you. And then I'll also say, you know, our team has been going through a lot this month. Uh, we do have 25 of our team members in Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, if you go to our website, if you go to any of our social media stuff right now, our entire, you know, wake up in the morning, first thing we're thinking about is the safety of those 25 individuals. Uh, as they navigate, you know, their safety in Ukraine. So, you know, if you're going to contact us, also please, you know, look to, to help. Um, there's uh, donation pages, public donation pages on our uh, site that we link to uh, where you can support the troops of Ukraine. Uh, but that's how we, if you go to anything that we're, we're on right now, you'll see that um, because we are, you know, supporting uh, Ukraine and we do hope that they win this war and, and this ends soon. Yeah. Um, and then just a place to contact us and, and just, you know, we're a studio that has people from all over the world, you know, and uh, we have 60 engineers and designers and QA and project managers, you know, from all over the world. Um, and we're ready to support client projects. You know, we've we've come through the last you know two weeks as a strong agency and we're looking to, you know, build products with individuals that or five-time entrepreneurs, like you suggested. Yeah, absolutely. I think definitely, you know, if you're interested in, in world-class uh, product build and really beautiful, I should mention as well. Thank Everybody, you. you should, people in the audience go that you're listening, go in the show notes and um, go check out the, the website because it really, you can get a sense of um, not only are they great at developing content, they have a ton of venture studio resources. I don't know if I mentioned this, but in my uh, newsletter that I send out every every week, I had uh, your article in there, and it was the most clicked this ah, week, yeah, nice. of last of last week's newsletter. So congratulations! Nice. But yeah, no, you have you guys produce a, a crazy amount of content. I love like you know the in depth analyses that you go through. Um, and, and everything. So yeah, everybody go check it out. Uh, they, you know, and definitely get in touch, um, and support the studio and, you know, our troops in the Ukraine. Um, yeah. and yeah, that definitely. So thank you so much appreciate for coming that. on the, the studio stack podcast, coming on the episode. I appreciate it. It was so great to learn from you. Yeah, Diana, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me and, and really had an enjoyable time. 